Okay, fantastic. So I think we are right at the top of the hour because I know Lana has a packed session and I do not want to take so many minutes of your time doing the intro and everything. I'll just uh, breathe through this so that I can hand over to Lana. So to everyone who's been able to join so far, thank you so much for making the time to be with us. My name is Masio Rangi. I'll be your host today. I lead developer relations activities for Underline Africa. And, um, you know, part of the things we get to do in the team is connect engineers to amazing engineers across the continent so that we all get to learn and share and level up. So hopefully this will be a, a very educational and uh, insightful hour for you. And you'll walk out of here with something that you probably didn't have, but happy to see your interaction. So today our theme is on how to use data to build products that, uh, that users love. Um, but before we get in there, I actually wanted to just do a very short icebreaker so that we can all feel connected. This uh, deck here shows flags of countries where we've had participants before, uh, anytime Andela does a workshop or a webinar. So I want to just take a moment, maybe 30 seconds. Go to the chat function, it's at the bottom of your Zoom application, and just tell us what country you're tuning in from because um, we actually open this up to the entire continent and it's good to, to know who's here. I really hope that, you know, you feel connected. It's not just here, uh, it's not just you who's come to learn. I see Lego Solomon, thanks for that. Um, it's everyone in the continent and it's good to see that a lot of people are actually connected uh, with the same, you know, what can I say, like purpose or goal. And Lana, I hope this is also exciting for you. Uh, as you as you yes. as you as you look forward to sharing with us, is it? Yes, I see users from all the countries that we uh, try to serve best with our products. I'm super happy about it. Oh, that's amazing! That's amazing to hear. I will let Lana uh, pull up her presentation, but as she does so, I like kicking this off with uh, just briefly going through the bio of our guest today. So once again. I want to say thank you for joining us to everyone who's here. Our guest speaker today is Lana. Lana has over 12 years of experience in software product analysis, ownership and management, and her primary focus as a product manager is delivering on the core value proposition of TrueColor, which is providing users with relevant identity information behind the numbers they are searching and making their communication trusted and palm free. Okay, so previously, Lana has been involved in shaping and delivering both enterprise and consumer products and providing value in large organizations such as Sony Mobile and Ericsson. And during her many years of, uh, at TrueColor, she's been leading and supporting multicultural agile teams in delivering some of the most valuable TrueColor features, including TrueColor identity platform, the contextual ad servicing, uh, serving platform, and the first versions of the TrueColor SDK. So you do have a mega mind in here. Make sure you ask her all the questions that you need, but without further ado, Lana, over to you. All the best. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Mercy. I hope I'm sharing the right screen here. I'm multitasking and uh, I just wanna make sure that you're seeing the right things. Uh, I'm really super happy to be part of uh, talks at Andela. I'm really fascinated by how passionate uh, the team at Andela is about these workshops and uh, sharing as much as knowledge possible uh, within the wider community, especially within Africa, where uh, some of our biggest markets are. Uh, and I'm actually happy that I'm going to be able to share some of the experiences that me and my team have gathered throughout the years of uh, building a product for a mass audience. Um, so, uh, during my 12 years in software, as Mercy mentioned, I've built enterprise products, I've built uh, consumer products, uh, I've built teams too, uh, and apart from products, technology, and leadership, what I'm very interested in is uh, how our minds work when we're exposed to different stimuli, uh, and also how we make decisions, and uh, how, for example, empathy and compassion can be applied when uh, we're designing good products. Uh, so a lot of those concepts are shared in this presentation. 
and um, uh, they're built on top of that interest of mine. And I just hope that this information that I will share today, you will find valuable and you will be able to bring it to your organizations or your day-to-day -day thinking about what really matters when building good software products. Uh, so a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to go through True Color at, at a glance uh, for those of you that haven't heard about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about why you can't rely just on intuition. Uh, we're going to cover some of the common biases when building products and uh, I'm going to give you some tips about how to overcome them. Uh, I'm going to give you some tips about how to find the, uh, the signals in the noise of information that we're consuming today. Uh, we're going to talk about why experimentation is prime uh, and we're going to round that with um, uh, how user research uh, can be used to inspire and empower. Uh, and we're going to finish with um, a short Q&A section. So I'm going to be aiming for having about uh, 45 minutes of uh, presentation uh, so that you can have at least 10 minutes um, uh, to ask your questions. Uh, so true color at a glance, um, uh, our founding story have began with um, uh, the old concept of uh, phone books and yellow pages uh, where people could just look up um, uh, everyone else's number. Uh, and uh, true color was founded in 2009 when um, uh, everyone started feeling the life changing effects of mobile revolution, uh, which also came with uh, a lot of difficulties like uh, unknown mobile numbers, spam calls, undesired calls, uh, privacy and security concerns concerns. Uh, so, so we were kind of first there uh, and um, uh, this enabled us to position ourselves as um, one of the first and today leading caller ID and spam blocking platform. Uh, so from a call identification and spam blocking app, we have actually uh, transformed the application into a super app uh, offering 360 communication through calls, uh, voice over IP, uh, messaging, and then we even have pay services in some of our specific geographies. Uh, some of our key metrics are uh, over 230 million million active users, uh, uh, for which we identify about 26 billion uh, spam calls um, uh, within a year. Uh, and uh, we can be proud to share that we have more than 500 million uh, app installs build date on the various platforms that we support. Uh, we are on uh, several pl pl places around the globe. Uh, our global headquarters is in Sweden. Uh, we have our Africa headquarters in Nairobi and our India headquarters in uh, uh, Bangalore. Uh, and then we have two more offices in India, one in Delhi and one in Mumbai. Uh, our top markets are India, Egypt, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. So you will notice three of our top markets, at least three of our top markets are um, in Africa today. Uh, and just a glance at the, uh, the specific um, uh, metrics when it comes to our African uh, market. Out of 230 million global mon monthly active users, uh, more than 50 million are coming from Africa, uh, for which we identify about 1.1 billion uh, calls uh, per month, out of which around 100 are unwanted for our users. So that's the impact that we can bring to the day-to-day -day communication of our uh, African users. Uh, so now, since you must be wondering uh, why this content is relevant for you, um, I actually believe that successful software organizations empower everyone to think about the needs of the uh, end users, which is the most valuable data that you rely on. Uh, and what we base our success most on is the fact that we consider everyone to be part of the product team at TrueColor. So, for example, we have engineers interacting with users over social media to debug issues. Uh, we have engineers conducting informal user surveys online. Uh, we have everyone empowered to challenge a decision which is made based on subjectivity and when there is uh, not enough evidence to back it up. And pertaining to our mission to be as data informed as possible and make uh, quick decisions, we have established full control over our features and triggers during the course of our release cycle, which enables us to use data in the best possible way to provide the best possible experience for our users. And then since this presentation is about um, uh, how to use data to build products, uh, the main questions that we're gonna ask uh, to begin with are gonna be, why is really data important? And uh, is this something that can replace intuition or uh, why you can't rely just on intuition when you're building good products? 
so let's explain some basic concepts uh, in decision making first. So there are in general, at least in the traditional sense, uh, two different paths in decision making. So we have the rational one and we have the intuitive one. Uh, so I'm going to start with the intuitive one uh, and we have the intuition as um, uh, the core of the intuitive decision making. Uh, so intuition is rooted in our experiences. So it's shaped by cause, effect, observation, reflection, and you may also know it as knowing or like when you say, yeah, I know what I need to do. That's primarily intuition. Uh, and um, it's basically the ability to understand or know something immediately based on your feelings rather than actual facts. Uh, so intuitive decision making is um, as a result instinctive, it's objective, and then it's subconscious in nature as well. Uh, and even though there are people that argue that intuitive decisions become more valuable in highly complex um, uh, or changeable environments, it's actually the opposite uh, that is true. Uh, so it makes sense for trivial or low value decisions or decisions that involve emotions or when speed is critical to a successful outcome. Uh, and then it still has a super important um, uh, place in decision making, but it has to be backed by uh, regular, rigorous analysis. Uh, on the other hand, we have the rational decision making, which uh, consists of a sequence of steps which are designed to rationally develop a solution. Uh, and then it relies on techniques on, um, um, uh, for collecting and then processing data. Uh, so the decision making uh, uh, follows a process starting from the problem until the solution uh, and then you gather information for analysis and uh, there is usually only single or best optimal outcome. And then decisions are objective, they're unbiased and they're based on facts. Uh, but do you really need to choose between one or the other decision making paths? And the truth is that data and intuition are not really on the opposite ends of the spectrum, especially when you're making decisions that real users are gonna use. So intuition is important, but then it needs validation. So in a lot of cases, intuition could still be at the center of decision-making, but it has to be supported by analysis. Uh, and the more options you have to evaluate, the more data you will have to weigh. Uh, so what we usually say is that it's not at all credible on its own, but it can definitely tell you when something doesn't seem right, even when the numbers are saying that everything works fine with your product. Uh, on the other hand, rationality is not always practical. So uh, sometimes uh, the rational analysis or data can be impractical uh, to be employed in certain situations. And uh, examples are unstructured problems, uh, when we have problems that lack clear decision rules or there are few objective criteria um, as to um, how to make the decision. Uh, like for example, I don't know, aesthetics judgment regard, uh, regarding whether a new design will perform better or worse. So every time you have an absence of, uh, absence of a definite criteria, when there are time and resource constraints, or when there are novel situations, uh, all of these um, uh, cases will limit the practicality of data if being used alone. Which actually leads us to the conclusion that the combination of intuition and rational analysis produces the well-rounded decisions that we actually need. So they allow us to approach the issue from various angles. So there may be times when intuition helps to narrow down the options, uh, which can then be analyzed in a logical or rational way. Uh, or then you can have the reverse when uh, initial detailed analysis may identify few options uh, that look equally good, uh, but then you need intuition to single out the right one. Uh, so it's reason and vision and context that stems from a healthy relationship between these two. So this actually points to uh, what we call informed intuition, which we consider as the foundation for innovation in uh, today's world. Uh, and uh, when you think about uh, informed intuition, I want you to think about it being the confidence that you get from understanding human behavior, uh, your specific user's behavior, and then practicing design thinking, um, exercising cre creativity, uh, and then having a passion for creating products that um, uh, delight the user and uh, also succeed on the market. Uh, which brings us to the actual decision-making paths that you really need to choose from in today's software world. 
so um, I'm making the distinction here between data driven and data informed. And those of you who read a lot uh, will find the data informed decision making as the like fourth stage towards data driven culture and then data driven being the last one. Uh, but in practice, these two can be used as separate strategies in decision making, depending on the problem that you have in ha at hand. Uh, and I'm going to elaborate a bit on both. Um, so um, when we talk about data driven approach to decision making, it means that we're placing the available data in focus and then we make business decisions just based on that. Uh, so when we follow a data driven approach means we follow the metrics and then we make decisions solely based on the facts and figures which are available. Uh, and data is meant to answer a very specific question and usually has only one dimensional use. When we talk about data inform, uh, it means that we're considering data as an essential source, but we use it as a context to understand the deeper uh, meaning. Um, or like if data says something, we have the right to challenge it according to this approach. And then the real growth lies when we have intuition and experience and wisdom put to practice uh, to use that data in the best possible way. Uh, so it's always important to weigh the types of decisions um, in order to decide whether to, to take one or the other paths. And but I will give you some of the examples as to how to choose. So uh, like, for example, the data driven, the best use cases um, uh, for using this approach is when you have to answer business questions. Uh, or let's say ensuring that changes to a product won't negatively impact the business. And uh, examples would be uh, like uh, uh, what design works better? Is it a version A? or a version B, um, should you have tested both of them? Or um, how much money will we make next month so that I can plan my budget? So it's very specific, like you need data and then you sort of, you, you tailor the answer to that specific data. Or let's say, how will adding new features impact the product? So all of these are examples where you get to use the data-driven approach because data is the only thing that you can rely on. Um, on the other hand, one of the most important use cases where you need to activate the data informed decision making is, uh, for example, when you're doing uh, design or user experience. So the data will not be able to tell you what your product should look and feel like. So um, the only thing that it can do, it will be to assess whether a, partic a particular design is helping your users in order to reach their goals or not. So when you need to decide between these two approaches, think about the type of the problem uh, that you're trying to solve first. Um, during my works, uh, during my years uh, working with uh, different products and different organizations, um, I have observed certain biases that have impacted the decision making process in various organizations. Uh, and today I want to talk with you about the most common ones uh, and then uh, share some tips um, uh, on how you can overcome them. Uh, so the most common biases that I'm talking about today are uh, the HIPAA product decision making, uh, focusing on power users and the different cognitive biases that exist in decision making. Uh, so uh, the HIP abbreviation stands for highest paid person opinion. Uh, and this is also called in the product world as uh, authority bias. Uh, and what this bias refers to is um, um, the decision making process, which is um, uh, done by one or few internal stakeholders, uh, which are in a position of power. Uh, and usually decisions are characterized by um, uh, skipping critical assessments and uh, being guided by common wisdom uh, and not much evidence in data, which actually results for too much of the roadmap uh, to be uh, based on opinion. Uh, and this is basically a common way of how a lot of organizations make the decision uh, in the beginning of a product launch or in the beginning years of business. And then as organizations grow, so does the organizational chart and so do more people need to be involved in the decision making process so that they can do their job better. So some of the tips on how to overcome the um, HIPAA bias is uh, um, uh, to actually depersonalize the decision-making process. So these uh, decisions uh, usually have emotions as a background. Uh, so it's important that you use data to take the emotions and opinions out of the decision-making process. Uh, that means for every opinion, you need to be able to use data in order to counter that opinion if the opinion does not uh, match what um, the users really need or what the users really want. 
Uh, so uh, that's where we come to the second point, which is uh, bring in the customer voices, uh, bring competitive data, uh, use other external benchmarks uh, in the analysis. Uh, or the most important thing is to find low cost ways to gather the initial data from the customers. So uh, do a uh, low effort experiments and uh, examples could be like just talking to a few users a day. They don't have to be many, but you need to start um, uh, having that dialogue with customers and bring uh, customers data in. Uh, and then what's important is also to use data to cover what the heap is concerned with the most. So this decision making, as we said, has emotions as a background and those emotions could be just worry about the bottom line, could be worries about uh, the ability to attract users or how the impact on user experience will be. So if you have data that speaks to the highest concern of the highest paid person, then this will uh, help to make the decisions more rational. Uh, the next one, which is super common in today's um, uh, product world, is uh, focusing on power users. So uh, let's get the definition straight for power users. So these are users that are usually most active on your platform. They're more visible, they're easily reached, uh, they're more responsive, and uh, as a result, they're overrepresented in data. Uh, they're likely more positive about your product and could be more forgiving. But note that they're more demanding. That's why we call them enemy of simplicity. So they're more likely to push for non-essential features or like push for something, let, let's say 1% of users pushing for something that 99% of the users do not really care about. Um, and then your desire to keep your power users happy and you founding your product decisions just based on them can lead to an over-engineered software. Uh, and that's going to have a very messy and complex interface and that will not work for the average user, which is the biggest concern here. So what you really need to focus on is um, setting up unified product vision. So you need to consider your target users, you need to consider your use cases, and then you need to consider the future direction that you wanna head towards. Uh, and you need to think about uh, use cases or what are the problems that um, your product actually solves. Then you need to think about the personas, uh, which are the specific people that you want to reach. Uh, so you need to look at the user base objectively, like who are the people that you're making your product for and why do they need what you're making? Uh, and then you need to try to get specific. So you cannot really just settle, okay, anyone who wants to buy my product, that's my target audience because it usually doesn't work that way. Uh, and the most important thing is that you need to stay focused on the goal to provide real people something of value first. And then you will focus on uh, who your power users are and what they actually want. Uh, and I actually have a great example of um, like how we deterred from power user buyers, the bias when uh, we were trying to retire one of our apps. Uh, so uh, back in 2016, um, after a long consideration, we decided to retire TrueColor, which was an app that was used and loved by millions of users. So it was our own dialer application. Uh, and we had TrueColor, its older brother, uh, that has been reliable source for identity information for our users. But like most of our use cases were shared between the apps. It made no longer business sense for us to develop and maintain uh, two different applications. Uh, and then our strategy or direction was to embark on a journey to create a full communication experience for our users. So um, uh, starting to enrich the use cases of TrueColor was the first essential step. And these comments that you're gonna see here are coming from power users, like they, they were angry at us. Uh, and uh, the feedback was negative. They wanted to keep the app. It was simple for them. That was the only thing that they wanted. But uh, at the same time, while we were doing this, we were collecting data and the data was telling us something else. Uh, so, uh, and this sort of like points to uh, a common um, inconsistency that we sort of um, uh, see in the product world that people say one thing, but the data shows uh, something completely different or there is a difference in what the users say versus what the users do. Uh, so the data show that the users were consistently moving from one app to the another, and then with some resistance, uh, they were adapting to the new interface. Uh, and there was a negligible churn as well, which was the most important metric that we were tra uh, tracking. So what we did, of course, is um, uh, we acknowledged these users' concerns, um, uh, but we had to stick to our unified product vision. And that vision was that 
we want to provide unified dialer and then searching experience on top of it. And we want to support all the use cases for our users without having to move them between the two different apps. We were also setting uh, up the foundation for uh, the creation of a 360 app uh, that we have become today. Uh, we have to focus on the use cases, which means that uh, our users should get a comprehensive dialer experience and then search experience in one app. So that was our goal. Uh, our personas were users in developing markets using mid to low range Android devices, which means we have to make our application work even for the lower end devices as well. And we want to provide a good user experience. Uh, and then um, uh, these users are those users that are facing the problem of receiving a lot of unsolicited communication per day, which is one of the biggest problems that we're solving. Uh, and then when focusing on value first, we wanted to provide at least the same experience that they had on TrueDialer before, plus the true color features that um, uh, they already appreciated um, uh, at that time. Uh, and then the bottom line of all this is always acknowledge what the customer is saying. Always acknowledge that uh, because the customer feedback can shape the experience, uh, but it cannot dictate the roadmap or the development. Uh, so users have problem. That's what you need to be thinking on. And uh, uh, but the way that you're going to solve uh, those problems uh, needs to work for the average user. Uh, so now let's talk about several cognitive biases in the decision making. Um, uh, cognitive bias in um, essence refers to like all the ways that our mind distorts information to match our existing preconceptions. Uh, and there are four different um, uh, types of um, uh, cognitive biases, at least that are more common in the um, uh, product world. Uh, we have the rose tinted spectacles, uh, which is um, uh, when we're searching or interpreting or focusing and remembering information that um, uh, uh, matches our existing assumptions. We have the availability cascade, uh, which is when you become personally invested in an idea that you have proposed. And then uh, it's basically that self-reinforcing process that the idea becomes more plausible uh, when it gets repeated uh, in public way too often. And like politicians are a good example for this one. Uh, and we have uh, the bandwagon effect uh, when we have um, uh, people that tend to a belief in certain things just because there are many other people that believe um, in the same thing. Uh, and then the last one is group thing when we have a group of people that all want to keep each other uh, happy and then they avoid conflict and uh, they try and maintain peace. Uh, I'm sure you have noticed what are the problems with all these examples that I've mentioned. So fear or ego or both of them uh, are getting in the way of making the right decisions and taking responsibility if cognitive biases are present in the decision-making process. And this is a serious problem uh, in terms of how you interpret the data and what kind of decisions are you making uh, based on that. So to overcome this, uh, the first strategy is to always have a devil's advocate in the team. And that is usually someone that pretends in an argument or a discussion uh, to be against an idea or plan that a lot of people support, or it could be just a problematic decision maker that, it, uh, that supports that idea, uh, in order to make the people to discuss and consider it in more details. So always have a devil's advocate in the team. Uh, another important thing is to have a, a objective point of reference for decision making. Uh, like, for example, you have to have rules and principle for UX. You have to have uh, tech and business rules when you're discussing your product strategy. Uh, it's important that also constructive debate is encouraged. It's important that people are not afraid to get into conflict. So a safe space needs to be created. And um, related to that, sort of the most tangible technique that you can use is the five whys. And uh, that entails that you keep debating and you keep asking while until you can agree that either the idea is worth pursuing uh, or it just needs to be dropped. Uh, so we've established that data is important, uh, but like, how do we make a proper distinction between what to hit and what to ignore? Uh, and this is a very important question due to the abundance of data that we encounter today. But I like to say that there is good news and there is bad news. And the good news is there is a lot of data available out there. And the bad news is there is a lot of data available out there. So uh, data is inexhaustible. Uh, and you may be tempted to look at all the possible trends that may describe how your features are used. And this is the tricky part. Uh, 
like more information is not necessarily better. Like uh, as we consume more data and the ratio of uh, noise to signal increases, the less we know about what's going on. And for those of you that uh, don't know, signal, important information, noise, basically everything else that clutters uh, your data or everything that you're supposed to be ignoring in your data. Uh, so this is where we talk about the noise bottleneck. Uh, so this is a, a paradox that Nassim Taleb talks about. And uh, uh, this is when we think that the, the more information we consume, uh, the more signal uh, we'll consume as well. Uh, but the mind does not work uh, that way. Uh, so when the volume of information increases, our ability to comprehend the relevant from the irrelevant becomes compromised. Uh, which leads us to the next point that data can actually be toxic in large and sometimes even in medium quantities. So the more immersed you get into looking into the data, the more uh, its inaccuracy is likely to increase as well. Uh, and there is also some sort of um, uh, uh, distortion with the frequency with which you're looking at data. So like uh, the more you look into the data, the more frequent you look into it, the more noise you're likely to find. So if you look at trends on a yearly versus, let's say, daily basis, this will give you different ratios of uh, signal to noise, the noise being more numerous um, as you look on a shorter periods of time. Uh, so basically, the most important question is how to track the right things or what is the data that you actually need? What is, the, what is it that you actually need to hit? So your starting point is to define measures that will help you understand your users. So you must define metrics that will measure your overall user satisfaction. And then there are some key concepts around measuring success uh, that you can follow, which are understanding key users, understanding churn, understanding user lifetime value. Uh, and all of this uh, allow you to understand the impact that your app has truly on the world. Uh, don't measure anything you don't plan to act on, super important. Everything you measure must have a purpose associated with it. So every time you design metrics, you have to have action on mind. Uh, focus on data that indicates success or failure for exactly your product. So you may be tempted to adopt metric that someone else has, but that your metric needs to make sense in your use case. So for example, at the beginning, Truecaller uh, had uh, use cases that were passive. So we have everything happening outside of the app. Uh, uh, and in addition to that, we haven't started with the ads channel. So for us, measuring time spent within the app made absolutely no sense. Uh, so the recipe is to think about the key behaviors on your app, and then you measure success according to uh, how many times uh, your user performs a key behavior within an um, expected time cycle. Uh, then we're talking about setting up and tracking competing metrics. So what we usually like to say in the product world is uh, uh, the territory is bigger than the map, which means like one of your metrics is not going to give you the full picture about what's going on in your product. Uh, that's why competing metrics are uh, necessary. Uh, and I can give you one example. So uh, we in TrueColor, for example, on search, we track how many times we uh, respond with a name for a number that our users are searching for, and we call that a hit rate. Uh, but that really doesn't talk about what's the quality of the names that we return to our users or how the users find this uh, metric valuable, how, how the users find these names valuable. So we need to establish a metric for the quality. So the soft spot is somewhere in between, uh, finding the right quality uh, for providing just enough names to our users that make sense to them or that are valuable to them. And then the last one is to remember that there is no single right thing to measure for everyone. Uh, like for example, uh, daily active users, which is a very popular uh, metric uh, used in today's software world, may be different for different applications. So it's super important that you find your own definition. No one else's definitions, uh, definition is gonna match uh, what your product actually needs. So you need to focus on the changes or the success that you wanna see in your product. So now that we have established the guidelines for setting and tracking good metrics, let's see how that is put into practice during experimentation. So this slide talks about uh, why experimentation is prime. And basically the most important takeaway that you need to uh, consider is that experimentation is the only way to systematically determine the effect that your product is going to have on the users. 
And one way to go about it is um, uh, to make it your usual way of working or treat all the new features as experiment. And this picture is um, uh, from Jeff Patton, which is a, a popular uh, agile coach, uh, one of those that I appreciate the most. And this is sort of the image that I always have in mind when uh, me and my team are uh, going on a quest to build something new for our users. Uh, so this is basically the, the lean product process. Uh, you take minimal cost to build on your assumptions, then you measure the impact and you learn from it. So you will remember it by build, measure, learn. Uh, and this is what we usually mean by creating a minimal viable product and testing it. So since it's a way of learning through testing, uh, you start by describing a hypothesis. Uh, uh, so this is an assumption about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what is it that uh, you're going to provide as a value or you're going to achieve as a success. So you need to recognize that it's a hypothesis. We can't assume that uh, people would need your product yet. Uh, then you go towards uh, identifying the assumptions, uh, which are uh, who your users are, what their needs are, as well as assumptions about how they would value and use your product. Then you separate the risk case assumption, which is usually those that would sink if uh, that would sink your product um, uh, if they uh, don't come true. Uh, you and identify an approach to validate the, the assumptions, like what is your minimal uh, viable product test, and what are the customers that you're going to talk to, uh, what are the prototypes or examples that um, uh, they could engage with uh, to validate your assumption. Uh, then you build your prototype, which needs to be small and needs to make sense from a cost perspective. And you start engaging with the customers to test the assumptions. Uh, you note everything that you learn along the way. Uh, and then once you're basically able to make sense of what you have learned, uh, you get to decide whether to rethink your product idea or whether to go um, and uh, build a big product that um, uh, you're going to roll out to um, your entire user base. Uh, and then you, most of the cases you get to repeat the steps between two and seven until you're really confident that you have identified the smallest product that you really want to build. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example for that as well. So we have this feature which uh, we call call alert and it's a feature that uh, uh, prompts you uh, before the call even happens and uh, it happens when another true caller user is um, uh, calling you. So we built this feature based on the assumption that our Android users would also like to be informed about calls uh, that are about to happen and it wasn't an unfounded assumption. Uh, we had this flow um, uh, since a while back on the iPhone and uh, uh, this is providing on iPhone at least some taste of the caller ID uh, on a platform that has a lot of restrictions on what app apps can do in terms of uh, calling experience. And they appreciated not just getting the caller ID, but also that early warning about the call. Uh, so um, our assumptions here were that, uh, for example, our users in developing countries uh, report that they experience network drop when they try to make calls. So we just assume that the other side might want to know before a call comes in so that they can get to prepare for putting the phone on silent, for example. Uh, and uh, um, for our assumption required validation. Uh, so we uh, brainstormed how to make minimal uh, costs so that we can get the necessary amount of data um, uh, to start the initial learning. Uh, so what we did is we reused as much as possible from the existing infrastructure. And then uh, we built a simple pre-notification and then we rolled it out to a few small markets and um, a tiny percentage of some of the bigger markets as well. And the solution was very flawed. Like uh, We didn't want to build a fully fledged infrastructure because that would have been costly and we didn't know still if it was worth it. Uh, so we had some optimization logic, we had some caching, uh, the alert did not show every time you would get the call, uh, but at least it got people to start talking about it. At least it got people to start seeing the value of this and also uh, to see how they actually missed not seeing the call alert on every call that uh, was uh, going through. Uh, so we tracked impressions, we tracked the regular user metrics such as churn, uh, but the most important was the, quality, the qualitative feedback, uh, as I mentioned, uh, through the various channels, like we have customer support, social media as well. Uh, and uh, our churn was not impacted. We got a lot of love from our users. We figured out a lot of use cases that we can cover basically with a, a, a single implementation of the uh, call alert feature. And then we went on to build a solid solution to serve uh, all our users. 
And then the fun thing was that our users invented so many different use cases about the feature. And this is just one of my favorite tweets that um, uh, some of our users have posted online about uh, their specific use case on how they could use uh, a call alert in um, yeah, their day-to-day -day, um, life use case. Uh, so I would like to talk about another important concept in experimentation, which is A-B testing. Uh, and I want to share one specific example of how we did an A-B test for one of the most important features of True Color, which is the spam detection. Uh, so spam detection caters to our mission to uh, provide the trusted and safe communication. And then it involves all the processes that enable us to signal to our users about potential unwanted calls. Uh, and for you to be able to grasp the size of the problem that our users are facing, uh, the following information is very relevant. So uh, this is data from uh, 2019 uh, when we detected around uh, 199 million unique spammers uh, that made 26 billion spam calls and sent about 8.6 billion messages. Um, uh, so this is a huge problem for our users worldwide. And basically our goals is, um, as I mentioned, to identify valuable versus um, unsolicited communication, provide an early detection, uh, give the users as much valuable info to make decisions about taking a call or dropping a call. Uh, we want to prevent blocking of important communication. So we want to steal the important calls to go through. Uh, we want to detect when uh, numbers change owners. Uh, we don't want to have the spam uh, inherited from a bad actor to a good actor on our platform. And then we also need to consider geographic, socioeconomic, and telco conditions for a specific market. And the reason why this is especially important is um, uh, uh, basically somewhat related to the fun facts that I would like to share. Like when we are looking into the data, uh, the data shows that, for example, our average Italian user makes more calls than a usual spammer in most of the other EU countries. Uh, let's say at least half the robocalls in India are useful, which is not usually the case in US where you can even get a call from your own number, which is the popular number spoofing case. Um, then we have a lot of people in rural areas, for example, that find it really impolite to drop the call, even to a spammer. So they will continue with the discussion for a long time, which is not usually the case for us impatient people in the metropolitan areas. Uh, and then, for example, in Sweden, we usually prefer messages over calls. So this all talks about the different specifics on the different markets, and it also explains why a single model may not work for everyone. Uh, so uh, when we talk about um, A-B testing, um, I, and now that you actually have more information about our spam detection, I want to share an example of how we performed an A-B test um, uh, for a change in our um, spam calculation model. Uh, so first, I want to look into what A-B testing actually is for those of you that uh, do not know and how we actually do it um, uh, at TrueColor. So an A-B test is an experiment uh, where two or more variants of a feature or flow are shown to the users uh, randomly. And then statistical analysis is used to determine what variation performs better for a given conversion goal. So we always start by setting the hypothesis, which is the prediction that you create uh, prior to running a, an experiment. Uh, and then that states clearly what's being changed and what you believe the outcome will be and why you think that's the case. And uh, for example, uh, in our case, uh, our hypothesis was that if we change the calculation in a X way, uh, which sort of goes more into the details of the implementation, uh, we will achieve 10% improvement in spam detection. So it shows what is it that is changed? What is it that we're aiming to achieve? Uh, the next stop is setting metrics and tracking. So you set up the analytics infrastructure that you are going to use to track the signals uh, from the split testing. So it requires defining the KPIs, adding necessary logging, uh, and then you also set up some notebooks and some dashboards for tracking. Uh, and let's say if in our case we said, now we're going to track how the numbers are being marked as spam versus not spam. Uh, then what you do is you need to plan the test and then you need to decide on the sampling. So uh, depending on the use case, you need to decide on the share of the audience that is going to um, uh, get the tested the behavior. Uh, so uh, you need to be mindful that this needs to generate enough data for you to be able to make uh, good decisions. Uh, and in our case, we picked random 20% of our users in India, Nigeria, Egypt and Malaysia. So, 
uh, we do sanity checks afterwards, and that's usually a basic check of the hypothesis. So we need to make sure whether uh, the metrics and the dashboards are set. Um, uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, the right users are getting the right uh, behavior. Uh, and then uh, basically we need to make sure that the testing group is not gonna get broken experience, even though it's a, a minimal viable product that you're actually testing. So in our case, we tried comparing significance differences, um, uh, ensuring that the right results are served, and making sure that our users will always be protected from top spammers, regardless if they're being tested uh, or if they're actually um, uh, falling into the uh, control groups. And then you can do AA test, which is usually run to make sure that your testing is unbiased. Uh, and this way you ensure that um, uh, the group you have picked uh, uh, is gonna be, uh, uh, you actually uh, ensure that both of the groups um, are having the same experience. Uh, so when you run the test, you know that um, uh, you can rely on the results. And not always AA test uh, needs to be performed. Uh, we have a huge audience, so we do prefer to uh, run AA tests so that we can make sure that our sampling is done in the correct way and we can trust the um, uh, results from the test. Uh, so uh, this is what it usually entails, serving the A experience to both of the groups to ensure unbiased sampling. Then you start running the experiment and then you track the uh, metrics, which means you serve the users based on the groups and then you check your dashboards all the time. Uh, when the time is right, and usually should be a minimum of a week of running a test, but usually it depends on your use case and how much data um, uh, you think you can gather. So remember, it has to be significant amount of data for you to be able to make good decisions. Then you need to close the test and you move over to interpreting the results, which means that um, uh, you decide whether the experiment was successful or whether it was um, a failure. So in our case, for example, this specific test gave 3% improvement rather than 10% improvement, which means uh, it didn't justify or it didn't prove the um, uh, hypothesis that we set in the first place. Uh, and this is a very, I would say, an, um, uh, I would say interesting outcome that sort of goes into um, the fact that, uh, okay, A-B tests can go both ways. You can either prove or disprove your, your hypothesis. But like there are a lot of things uh, that can happen during the experiment or after the experiment that could render your whole A-B test a waste of time or resources. And some of the examples are, for example, uh, setting an invalid hypothesis. So you set a prediction that is incompatible with what you developed. Uh, by a sampling. So you have two different groups that are very different. They're not random enough. And then the split testing is not going to give you results that you can rely on. Uh, we have running the test for too long or too short time. Like uh, if you're running it for too short time, you're risking that you're not going to get enough data. But if you're running it for too long, then you're risking that you're going to make so much cost that it will render the whole testing process um, inefficient. Uh, and we have seasonality, like comparing the results over different periods of times, which is uh, uh, wrong, like circumstances change. The same test may give different results today and one month from now. Uh, we have peaking, which is uh, uh, usually stopping the test on the very same day that you notice a significant uh, change, uh, which is wrong because the peaks need to be analyzed over a period of time. You have to run that test for a long enough time so that you can validate the significance of those changes. We have running ineffective tests that are a waste of time and money. Uh, so we have, for example, testing things that you anyways plan to implement. Not, I mean, not everything needs to be tested. Uh, testing too many variables, um, uh, testing unnecessary features and behaviors. Let's say you test colors on buttons that do not really trigger conversion. It doesn't really matter what the color is, right? Uh, we have adjusting variables while the test is running. Like you can change the audience, you can change, uh, you can add the variable, and all of this renders your test um, um, irrelevant, or it uh, basically makes uh, uh, the whole testing process um, um, uh, erroneous. Uh, then we have measuring changes in an incorrect way, which could either be by setting wrong KPIs and metrics for the behavior tested, or you can look into wrong trends and patterns. And the last one is harking, which is like, hypothesizing after the results are known. Uh, like you're just picking those data points that match your hypothesis, or you're just looking into data to adjust the hypothesis. Like in my case, for example, I could have said, okay, yeah, our hypothesis is wrong, 3% is fine. But the, three, the cost that we're gonna make in order to develop a solution that will just give us 3% improvement is not justifying 
uh, is not justified for the benefits that we're getting. So if we're aiming for 10%, then we need to re uh, rethink the solution, go back to the whiteboard, think about what is it that we need to change, and then run an additional test that will help us um, uh, get those 10% that we're really after. And the last section I want to go through quickly is um, uh, uh, user research. So uh, we talk a lot about how experimenting can uh, create meaningful quantitative data to validate your intuition or prove your assumption. But I would like to talk about the value of uh, uh, qualitative data and some of the ways you can easily tap into it. Uh, so here I want to emphasize the importance of moving to a culture devoted to uh, doing a great user research. Uh, so I strongly believe that this process empowers them to do more targeted and meaningful work. But I also think it empowers users to better use their product uh, in order to fulfill their needs. Um, and I'll start with empathy. So we all like to say that we're obsessed with listening to our customers, but all that means nothing unless we can really feel the problem that they endure while using our app. So empathizing with users is really important for finding good solutions to the problem. Um, and uh, let's say in this case, we had um, an issue with, um, uh, or issue reported from the PUBG community, which is a big uh, gaming community in India. Uh, and uh, uh, they were basically complaining about uh, our app uh, disrupting their gaming experience and basically throwing them out of the game, which is the worst experience ever. Uh, so we actually got people to start playing the game for weeks, to start feeling the same problems that our users are seeing. And uh, basically uh, for them to understanding the pain that our users are, um, uh, are feeling. Uh, so then we started, that's where the uh, brainstorming made more sense. We had more insights, we had more information. We were able um, to actually try and solve the problem in a better way. So our users also felt heard, they felt appreciated, and also their motivation to use and evangelize the app became higher. So you have the left and right, left is the complaints, and the, the right side is where people really appreciated that we took the time to uh, hear their problems and try to solve them. Uh, I mentioned about engineers uh, involving with uh, customers. So this is something that I really highly um, uh, encourage in my team. So on the left side, there is an engineer in one of my teams. On the right side, there is an engineer in the growth team. And both of them are trying to help users in their own way. One of them through Twitter, the other one by trying to do requirements and solicitation in LinkedIn and trying to understand what is it that users would actually need. Uh, so what's important is that um, uh, you empower everyone, but have clear rules. Like, for example, privacy and security matters cannot be responded by everyone. They have to be responded by experts. And if users want to share private info for debugging, that that needs to follow privacy rules. It has to be shared through official channels. Not everyone needs to be able to take that data. Uh, be mindful of, lang of language and ethics as well. It's uh, super important. It has to be according to the brand rule. Uh, and then uh, everyone needs to know that social media should be used to help users, not to defend the brand, not to go into conflicts or not to share misinformation about the brand. Uh, and just the last part is uh, try to use as much as possible in in-app feedback channels. So um, engaging with community is great, but it requires a lot of manual work to process uh, what customers feel about you. So whenever you have the circumstance, just ask the users as close to the point of an event happening, how do they feel about it? Uh, like we have this flow where we ask users, is this the right name? Is this correct? And that helps us a lot to improve our process on how we clean name, how we censor them, and how we elect the right names for users. So asking users for feedback directly makes them feel like they're part of your journey. And the more involved and engaged you keep them, which is the same thing as with teams, the more motivated they will be to contribute to your success and your ability to build uh, uh, products that everyone loves. So this is just a sum up. Use informed intuition, meet opinions with data, Make your product work for the average user. Measure only what you'll act upon. Experiment, experiment, experiment. And then good user research will always empower both of your teams and your users. And I'm sorry for taking a bit longer, uh, but I uh, really put a lot of love into this content and I really wanted to make it valuable for you so that you can have something to take with you. So I hope I'm gonna have time to answer some of your questions now. Thank you so much, Lana, once again. We appreciate having you here. We had fun, uh, given the number of questions that are also coming in. But to everyone else who's on the call also, thank you for joining us. We hope you've been able to learn 
uh, something that you probably didn't know or a question you had has been answered, we appreciate you. So keep engaging with us on social. You're going to find uh, upcoming events, similar events, and we are happy to always have you. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.